aim. Fire. Shoulder. Arm. Order. Arm. So as you see, we have a small detachment of troops here. Normally a Civil War regiment back then would be about a thousand men, but to give you um, a comparison, during the Gettysburg campaign, regiments were roughly around 350 guys. So you just imagine that stretched out along here towards that fence line in the distance. Um, now when you're going through these maneuvers, uh, they are designed to be done in these close linear formations. And we're gonna pull uh, Rich out here to show you how they load in nine times. Um, this is done by all the different manuals of the day. Whether you're using Hardy, Scott's, Casey's, which we're using right now, uh, Gilms, or any other manuals that were produced during the time period. And again, all these maneuvers are being done in close linear formations, so it's conforming to the body, so that way you're not jostling the man next to you, and everything's done in a safe manner. And you fellows can load as you're going through the motion as well. Shoulder, arms. Load in nine times. Load. Handle, cartridge. Tear, cartridge. Charge, cartridge. Draw, rammer. Ram, cartridge. Return, rammer. Prime. Shoulder, arm. So the first firing demonstration we showed what it would look like if the whole entire company or a regiment uh, would fire at once. Um, you can also then fire by file, and then after that it become independent fire, and the men would fire at will. And we're going to demo that for you folks. Attachment ready. Fire by file. Commence firing. Now, trained infantry men during this war could usually get up about three rounds per minute, and this is going to demonstrate how they would operate during independent fire. Attachment ready. Aim. Fire. Shoulder. Arc. Order. Arc. So those are the different many ways that you can go about firing. Usually it's independent fire for these men. Uh, we're going to bring out uh, Matt over here. He's going to talk about the innovations in rifle technology and also ammunition during the Civil War. Hi, my name is Matthew Locke. I'm with the Liberty Rifles, and I'll be talking to you about some of the innovations that were made during the Civil War. Now, you're at the height of the, Amer uh, the Industrial Revolution now, so everything that's manufactured on here now can be taken to another gun and assembled, whereas before, each piece was handmade and was more of a piece of art than a weapon. And you could literally take this gun apart and put it together at another one. Another big innovation was the rifled grooves in the musket that would catch the ball and literally spin it inside the barrel so that when the ball comes out of the piece, it is going on a straighter trajectory, creating your volunteer soldiers 
into more potent killing machines. Whereas before, if they didn't shoot a gun before, they're probably not going to hit anything. The tactics of the time, at the beginning of the war, you still had Napoleonic tactics where men were lined up in single file lines, bringing as much fire to bear at a concentrated point. Now towards the middle and the end of the war, you have men digging in, getting ready for an assault. So you see higher casualties on the end that is attacking a defensive position. Thank you. Then most ranges these men be firing at. Um, previously, before the advantation of the rifled musket, you'd be using smooth bores. Um, those are firing usually 69 caliber ball. You're only getting about 100 yards out of that maximum uh, range. Um, now, the fighting that took place during the Civil War, uh, the average range of these uh, conflicts and these engagements are taking place around 250 yards. Um, we are now going to take you folks over and hand you off to the artillery, and it'll talk about. Um, how we load and fire an artillery piece and innovations in artillery uh, weapons during the Civil War. Hello everyone, my name is Chris Rusin. I'm joined by Rich Taddeo. We're both members of the Liberty Rifles. We're going to talk to you a little bit about federal uniforms in the Civil War. And what we're wearing today was what was issued uh, to federal soldiers and was the mainstay of the Army uniform. What I'm wearing is the 1858 Army dress coat. This was the formal uniform coat of the Union Army in the Civil War. Also, what's commonly known as a sack coat or a fatigue blouse was very predominant throughout the Civil War. That coat was lighter, it was less restrictive, and it allowed for more ease of movement and was overwhelmingly issued to Union soldiers during the Civil War. The purpose of the fatigue blouse, or the sack coat, was to be worn during manual labor, fatigue duties, and this dress coat was really meant to be worn during the dress parades and really the more military and everyday use. Fatigue blouses were less costly, they were lighter, and ultimately got produced more and issued more throughout the war based on its utilitarian use. Uh, by soldiers in the army. Uh, going down the row here is what we have uh, dressed for Union soldiers would be the, the trousers. Trousers are made of kersey wool and all these uniforms are made of wool. A lot of people ask well, why are they wearing wool? Wool tends to be hot, is what we think of sweaters and things of that nature. But wool was really just the best material for the armies of that time to use because it's durable and unlike the common conception about wool and that it's hot, don't want to wear it during the summer months, as a natural fiber, wool is actually quite breathable and it actually stands up pretty well in the heat. Also it keeps you warm when it's cool. So that's why armies are using wool in their uniforms to get the most durability out of the garment as well as its heating properties and cooling properties that it retains. Soldiers were also issued government issue shirts. And Rich is wearing a, a standard federal issue shirt here. It's got a nice slit down the, the middle here for breathability. Oftentimes when soldiers are on fatigue duties, they're going to be less hampered by restrictions. They're going to be taking their shirts off, working. We, we have one member in our unit, Mackenzie Blair, who's has got a really good impression uh, for federal soldiers on fatigue duty, not wearing shirts. Um, Rich is also wearing an army dress hat. This was the uh, mainstay hat that was issued to soldiers in the federal army. I'm wearing a forage cap. Again, the difference between dress and official uniforms as well as fatigue uniforms to be worn uh, when it's less formal. The fatigue cap, or excuse me, the forge cap, is going to be issued far more just because it doesn't take as much.
to produce than the wolf felt hat. But these do see a lot of service in the Union Army on both sides, East and West theaters, and uh, all across the row here. Shoes. Soldiers were issued shoes. Obviously, when you're marching anywhere between 12, 20, 20, sometimes 25 miles a day, your footwear are very important. They're obviously, they're made from leather, and soldiers would go through these quite frequently, especially on campaign. Uh, there's accounts in the Gettysburg uh, campaign that soldiers being issued brand new sets of shoes are going to chew through those within about a two month time frame and will have to wait to be resupplied once battle's over, the campaign's over, and the supply lines have uh, a greater chance of, of catching up and you can get those equipment. Canteen, just a tin canteen there. Notice the wool cover on there. Why is the wool cover on there? Well, it's to keep the liquid inside cool, primarily. Uh, your soldiers are gonna be going through a canteen not as fast as what we would generally think because especially in modern military, command is hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Soldiers don't have access to water whenever they want. They have to fill up at local water sources, streams, rivers, or wells whenever they can. So they're not drinking quite as much water as we're accustomed to today when you're being physically exertive. Standard issue knapsack for the federal soldier. It's gonna contain all your personal items as well as your blanket. Now, most soldiers are gonna to wanna to keep these things light. Why? Well, talking about marching 25 miles, you're gonna start shedding unnecessary items as fast as possible. Here we see in Rich's knapsack, he's got his blanket. Those come in handy. When you're sleeping at night and it's dropping down into the 50s or 40s, he's also got his forage cap there for forage and, and fatigue duties. He's got a cup here. It's seen a lot of use. The soldier's gonna sit this right on the campfire or the embers to cook up any kind of coffee, cook up any kind of food rations such as rice, and it's got a handle on here. Why is the handle on here? Well, it's obviously just to allow ease of taking that off the fire without burning yourself. Now, the next thing that we'll see in, of the same material is the haversack. Haversack's gonna contain your food items. Soldiers are issued rations, typically on campaign, to subsist of three days worth of food. Now, the haversack is made of a linen or canvas, and it's going to be painted with a period recipe of linseed oil and lamp black and some other things. And when dried, it will have a waterproofing or at least a water repelling effect on the haversack so that it keeps grease off the uniforms, grease contacts of, of bacon or pork or whatever kind of meat ration. And it's also gonna keep the items in here mostly dry when you're marching through rain or subject to rain. Thanks, Rich. Okay. Now, accoutrements. These are important things. Federal soldiers were expected to keep these things in good service as long as they can. They're made of leather. We have a cartridge box here. Cartridge box is going to contain your ammunition. Union soldiers were commonly issued 40 rounds of ammunition that go in the cartridge box. This flap here is to make sure we're trying to keep water out containing the cartridge. Cartridge is gonna look something like this. It's gonna contain your black powder, which is the propellant that burns to force the bullet or the mini ball that would be inside this round outside of the gun and striking the intended target. It's just wrapped in a brown paper that's easily ripped off by the soldier in his mouth to allow him to ram the cartridge into the rifle, which we already demonstrated. He's also gonna be wearing a waist belt, again, made of leather. On the waist belt, it's gonna have his cap box. As we demonstrated in the firing de demonstration, the cap box is gonna contain brass caps. The brass cap within it is going to have a substance called fulmate of mercury that when the hammer falls down on the inside, it's going to cause a spark. The spark is gonna travel down the cone of the weapon or the nipple of the weapon into the chamber and ignite that powder. Also on the waist belt is going to be the bayonet scabbard. 
Thank you. The bayonet is affixed to the rifle and is held in place on the scabbard until it's been ordered to be withdrawn and affixed to the musket by whoever is in command of the body of soldiers. Bayonets are intended to be used in close quarter action. Again, talking about Napoleonic tactics, the bayonet is still heavily relied upon. Is it effective? Well, there's debate about that. Some studies have shown that there's only been 2% of Civil War casualties were inflected with the bayonet. Most soldiers didn't use them. They're quite a gory weapon. Notice the triangular point. That's so that the bayonet doesn't get hooked into the body when you're stabbing somebody with it. And it's also meant to have a gaping wound. And really, when we're using the bayonet, we want to disable the other soldier. And that's going to cause a pretty grisly and ghastly wound and knock them out of the battle. Thank you. Soldiers were also issued pairs of socks. Those are going to be made of wool. Soldiers are going to be resupplied whenever their equipment is um, not meeting military standards, when it's ragged, when it needs to be replaced. Now, soldiers were allotted certain amounts of different things. If you went over your allotments for, let's say, coats or a hat or even your rifle and you could not show any kind of military need why you lost that item or why it was damaged, it was on that individual soldier to pay for it out of his $13 a month that he was paid by the federal government. If, however, his commanding officer or the soldier was able to illustrate why he lost that item, the circumstances around it met military requirements, he's going to be reissued that from the federal government at no cost to him. That kind of wraps up my talk about the uniform of federal soldiers during the Civil War. I hope you enjoy. Thank you for joining us here at AHEC at the industrial and technology during the war. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.